Presented by Caltech. I want to like start off by taking a little detour today and take you back to the 17th century for a minute. So in 1650, some, some dude, I forget the name of the dude now, but this guy, he posed a problem. He asked, could you solve for the following mathematical series? Sum over m from um, 0 to infinity, 1 over 2m plus 1 whole square. Okay. This is basically just uh, for m0, this is 1 over 1 square, plus 1 over 3 square, plus 1 over 5 square. So 1 over squares of all the odd integers. We would ask for the sum of this uh, series. And this was posed in 1650. Anyone here know how to solve this? Anyone here have ideas what the answer is? Yes. This is famously called as the Basel problem. It has other variants as well, but uh, it's called the Basel problem after the town in Switzerland, Basel. And this series looks weird, and you might wonder, like, what does this happen to physics, physics two way? Probably nothing. You can see about it. But this problem posed as a well-defined mathematical problem. At least one can imagine there might be a solution because you're adding up terms which get smaller and smaller as you go along. So it might converge to a certain number. What that number is, we don't know. Okay. It took people another, I don't know, 85 some years, I don't know when this was solved, 1735. So someone solved this in 1735 and gave an answer to this series. And that person who solved it was Leonard Euler, the same guy who um, discovered the Euler's formula for complex numbers, <coughs> either the i theta is cos plus i sine. That same guy, he was able to solve for this series. I must also mention that this series has connections with um, ideas in number theory, with Riemann zeta functions. There's a whole bunch of you know really interesting concepts connecting integers and prime numbers and so on and so forth. So anyone here know what the answer is? Or how to solve this series? At a loss for words. No one cares. Just a series. Let's get back to physics to it. So, now the board is back, as you requested. So what we discussed last time, if you have a string, which is uh, has some boundary conditions, and x equals 0, x equals L, it's oscillating and so on and so forth, uh, the nth normal mode of that string genetically has the form some spatial part from um, the amplitude of each of the particles, a n plus k n x plus b n sine k n x, and some time-dependent oscillation, which was cn plus omega nt, dn plus omega nt. And the general solution is always a sum of these n normal modes. Okay? So you just add them up all together, and depending on what a n, b n, c n, d n are, fixed by initial conditions, you can find the solution to my problem up here. Okay? Then we discuss the fact that, say my string starts from rest, so the velocity or speed of the string, so partial y, partial t, at the starting instant, it is 0 for all x. There is some shape which it might have at the starting time, but the speed is 0. In that case, we prove that the dn's vanish. That's just by setting partial y partial t to 0. The cost becomes a sine. Sine at 0 has to vanish. So therefore, the dn have to go away. OK? Simple uh, argument there. Then, if you have fixed, fixed boundary conditions, because of which the spatial part has to also obey the, the boundary conditions, and therefore the ANs vanish because the, the, the cosines would not adhere to the, to the fixed boundary conditions, only the sines at x equals x equals f can have no oscillations, and because of which ANs are zeros, and the KN becomes quantized in n pi over L. And n is 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 4. So therefore, 
for a string which starts from rest and is fixed fixed boundary conditions, which is what most of this course is about, your general solution is the sum of all the normal modes, some unknown coefficients bn's, times sine n pi x over l times the oscillatory function in time. Okay. So at this stage, the bn's are unknowns, which we want to find. Okay. And I'll try to do an example right now to try and give you the sense of how to actually compute these bn's and how powerful that is. Oh yes, thank you. That should have been a sign. So Cn cos omega n t and tn sign, and therefore the string is not moving at equals to zero. Um, the, the sign terms don't respond to Okay, so let's talk about a particular example, which is interesting. So think about, let's say you have a guitar string, okay? And what I do is I fix my guitar string on the bridge. So here's my guitar string. This is x equals zero, x equals f. This might look like a particular example, but the same method applies everywhere. So look for the general features as we as we go along. And this guitar string is fixed fixed on both the on both the sides. And I pluck it at t equals to zero in a very generic way. I just you know pull up the middle of the string. So my string looks like like that. Okay. I pluck the string and I'm about to leave it. And I pluck it to a height h okay, at the center. So this is L, e, L, o, L over 2 for x. So that's my string at t equals to 0. Okay. And I leave the string from rest. The string starts with no speed. Okay. So when you find a given shape, first of all, characterize it. Write down the equation for the initial shape of the wave, of the string. Okay. Let's call this p of x. This is the, the shape of the string as a function of x at zero time, the initial shape. Okay. What is this function? It's a straight line from 0 to L over 2 with increasing slope, L over 2 to L with decreasing slope, just two lines. Okay, so I can have a piecewise function which describes this thing. So for, for x between 0 and L over 2, I have something, and x from L over 2 as well. Okay, what's the first function? It's, it, 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 it increased by a height of LH in an x range of L over 2. So it's the y change over the x change, the slope times the x. So this is 2h over L times x. You all see that? Slope times x. And the second decreasing part is just 2h over L times so when x is 0, it's 0. When x is L, it's 0 again. When x is L over 2, it's h. x is L over 2, it's h. Okay. So that's my simple uh, shape of the string at t equals to 0. Any questions about this? Is that OK? OK, good. So all right, I have that. That's like, that looks good. So once I have this, I know the fact that starting from rest, and I know the shape at t equals to zero. So the general solution of my equation is the sum of the normal modes again. So it's just sum over n equals one to infinity, unknown constants bn's, sine n pi x over l times cosine omega n t. Okay. Now what do I know? I know the shape of the string at t equals to zero. So let's plug that in. So at t equals to 0, y x comma 0, the shape of the string at t equals to 0, is a given function to me, p of x, what I specified to you. You pluck the string. Equals sum over n, 1 to infinity, dn sine n pi x over l, <coughs> cosine omega n t equals 0, because this is the shape at t equals to 0. So cos 0 is 1, therefore there's a 1. So what I have, I have decomposed my initial function into a sum of sine terms, okay? And this is the Fourier decomposition of my 
of my initial uh, shape of the string. Okay. Now, the beauty of this decomposition is that this is true for any function p of x. It has to have some features, like it has to be I mean, continuous, I guess. There's some features which I go into p of x, but for or we care about, for every px, there is an expansion into simple sum of sinusoids. So any complicated function can be built up from sinusoids by choosing the appropriate BNs. We don't know what the BNs are as of the moment. We will find them. <coughs> but this is what we have. Okay? And that's the beauty of Fourier decomposition. It's like an alphabet for any function put together in terms of sinusoids, and you know what to do. And remember, all of our stuff so far is linear. And I know how to, you know, do the physics in each of these sign terms. We've learned oscillations, simple harmonic stuff for the last five weeks. So I know how each of these terms behave. If I know each of them, their sum behaves in a very controlled way. Okay? So even though I start with this weird shape, I can solve for all times how the shape is going to oscillate by using the Fourier decomposition and then doing a bunch of stuff. Okay? So I have a P of x and I want to decompose it into sign terms, I don't know what the BNs are. My first step is to find the BNs. General solution, t equals to zero, use the shape, find the BNs. How do we do that? There's a famous trick called the Fourier's inversion trick. All right, so Fourier's Trick. How many of us here plan to take physics 2B next term? Remember this. This is going to be useful like every day to physics 2B. Okay, not every day, almost every day. This is a very important thing in, in, in math. So I have, let's just put this down again. This is important, like, really like what's going on. P of x, sum over n equals 1 to infinity, 1 to infinity, unknown bn's, sine n by x over there. Okay. P is a known function. What do you do? There is a method. There's an algorithm. Multiply both sides by, let's say, sine, um, what should I call it? I don't want to call it m. I've used n. Let's call this n prime. Sine n prime by x over there. Multiply this on both sides. Okay. So I have P of x equals sum over n equals 1 to infinity are linear functions. If I multiply a linear function to a sum that just goes in, the sum from 1 to infinity, bn's are numbers, sine n pi x over l times sine n prime pi x over l. Okay. For some integer n prime, some positive integer n prime, just multiply it for some n prime, okay? n prime so is, a, is a variable right now. That's the first step. Second step, you integrate with respect to x. It will start looking a little horrible, but it will condense back again. So hang in there if you're getting a little intense about what's going on. Integrate with x on both sides. Integrate dx. Integrate from where to where, from zero to l my range of integration of the string, 0 to L. Okay. Let me um, <coughs> use the left-hand side on the right-hand side first. So let's look at the right-hand side first. Now, it's a sum over product of signs, and I'm integrating each of them. So I can pull the integration inside, exchange the sum for the integral. Is that okay with everyone? Okay. Integration of a sum is the sum of the integrations. It's all linear. Okay? So the right hand side looks like sum n equals 1 to infinity. Bn's are just numbers. They don't affect the integration. Only the x dependent terms need to be in the integral dx. So bn's are outside, integral dx sine n pi x over l, sine n prime pi x over l. And if you get worried about why do I put a dx first or a dx after? It doesn't matter. Put the dx anywhere you want. Yes? So if you pull out the bn because they're all the constants, is that, like, is it in the sum? Like, that's 
it is in the sum because the sum is over n. Okay. Right? So when you're summing over the different n, the n's for different n's, but the integration is over x. So you only want the x dependent piece here. Good. And again, just reminding you, this dx could be placed anywhere, don't get bothered about is this dx here, does it mean something else? It doesn't. Later on in life it might, <laughs> not here. Okay. Zero to one. That's the left hand side. What's the right hand side? Right hand side is just function of x, function of x, dx, that, that looks more manageable. dx p of x sine n prime pi x over that. All with me? This is important. So if there's any question in any algebraic step, please ask me. Then I'm going to talk to this in the homework, on the final exam in life. As engineers, you're going to need this. I can guarantee you that. So any questions in this flow of thought uh, is best interrupted right now. Questions? Yeah. Well, why and prime is just something that you Just cause. Just cause. And you'll see why. So um, that's a good point. So for some n prime, which is a positive integer, it belongs to z plus positive integers. And y right now, just cause. Does like the n prime represent anything physical or? It's just an integer. Just like the sure. n's represent some normal modes, n prime could label another normal mode. And you'll see how that is. n prime is just an integer, okay? So n prime is just either one, two, one, two, three. But if you using it as a variable at the moment, okay? Now look at this, the right-hand side of my equation, integral dx, <laughs> px is a known function, sines are known functions, there's some argument that has some n prime, so it's an integer, but it's some known trig function. So this integration here can be solved. Once I specify my initial shape, I know px, I can solve this right-hand side. You all see that? So this right-hand side can be solved. This is good, you're good with that. That is something known. Our goal was to find dn's. But what we have right now is a sum over dn's with these horrible looking <coughs> integrations multiplying it together. We need to isolate the dn's out. My goal is to find dn's, okay? <coughs> All right, so let's do some more trick. Let's go back to high school. It's a good age. So I have a multiplication of sine and another sine. So if I have some sine alpha times sine beta, anyone remember what its decomposition is in terms of alpha plus beta and for minus beta? No, I don't remember it either, I didn't look it up last night. You know, when I was young, so when I was in India in my undergrad days, actually before my undergrad days, so I went to an IIT and to prepare for an IIT entrance exam, there used to be two years of you know coaching. They used to prepare you for the entrance exam. Like five million people said 5,000 get it. It's, it's pretty harsh. And there are coachings to get into the coaching, you know. There's like an inception of uh, coachings. And they would make you rote learn these formulae by heart. Because if you see it, you need to know how to use it. So back in the day, I was much more swift and, you know, just wake me up and ask me, I can tell you what the formula was, but not anymore. All right, so I looked it up. It looks like one half cos alpha minus beta plus cos alpha plus beta. Okay. This is how this trig identity goes. Multiplication of two sines looks like um, sum of cosines with the arguments adding and subtracting. So that might look a little, little, look a little more better because multiplication of sines seems hard to handle, but sums of cosines, you could break it up. So it seems more easy to handle. Let's see how that works. Keep this down here. Find me. Let's go there. Let's use that. So left hand side, sum over n. I won't always write down n equals one to infinity. Sum over n means one to infinity, just a shorthand. Bn's integral dx over 2 because of the half in the identity, times cosine 
alpha minus beta, alpha is n pi x over L, beta is n prime x, n prime pi x over L. So it's cosine n minus n prime pi x over L plus a little bit of minus, well it's plus. Let me check this. I have this somewhere. It's a minus, but that won't really make a difference. Just take note, this is the minus get in here. So that's a minus. Cosine n plus n prime by square. And I'm integrating this with respect to dx. This is my left hand side. It is equal to a right hand side, which I have already, I can play with easily. Let's not write those again, it just looks horrible. This is my left hand side, okay? Let's look at the, the cos n, n plus n prime term. I am integrating this out. The integration can go inside. It can integrate this term minus integrate this term term. What's the value of the integration of integral cos n plus n prime pi x over l dx from 0 to l. What's the answer? Remember my advice from my first class. It's when I ask you answers, it's either 0, 1, or infinity. So you have a decent chance. Zero. 0. You're right. Any justification for the 0 or you're playing 1 thirds? That's fine. <laughs> I'm okay with that. So when you integrate the cost, what do you get? Sine. So when you integrate, let, let's, let's talk about this argument. Let's not write everything down step by step. You integrate this thing, okay? The cos, it becomes a sine n plus n prime pi x over L up to some overall <coughs> constants, like n plus n prime pi L, yada, 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 no one cares. You have a sine. The cos becomes a sine. And it's evaluated at 0 and L and subtracted. So it's a definite integral, 0 and L. When I put in L, and when x is L, the LL cancels. I have sine n plus n prime times pi. n is an integer, n prime is an integer, or sum is an integer, and sine of an integer times pi vanishes. Okay? So this thing. So this second part of the integration did not come to me. Are we all okay with that? You might have seen this before, maybe the lecture, but I think. It's important to go over this one more time and see it happening in action for an actual example. Are we all okay with that? Everyone? All right. So the first, second piece vanishes. You might say, what about the first piece? When you integrate this out, what do you get? <coughs> Cos gives me a sine. I get a sine n minus n prime pi x over L at x equals L minus x equals zero. Like, hey, that should be zero again. That's how it's done. When you integrate this out, this, this uh, the cosine piece, you get something like a sine n minus n prime by x over l between 0 and l. How much is that? Zero or non zero? <coughs> zero. But for a given condition, under what condition? Is it going to be zero? Excellent. When n and n prime are distinct, when they're not the same integer, then n minus n prime is another integer. And therefore, this thing vanishes. But if n were n prime, then in the integrand itself, I have cos of zero, whose integration is not sine. Okay? So the second term always vanishes because there's a sum of the n and n prime. The first piece has two possibilities. So let me write this down again. Um, integral 0 to L dx cos n minus n prime by x over L equals either 0 if n prime is not n. The same argument holds. But if n prime is n, then what do you get? If n prime is n, cos of 0, it's 1. Integrating 1 with x, you get an x. From 0 to l, you get an l. Divided by 2, so you have l over 2. 
do we all see that? I kind of made my argument, I made my case, but if you are not convinced, please ask me. You all see it? Okay. In that case, uh, so these green things were just to kind of argue, in back to the reactive equation. This is sum over n, dn. Now, the second thing vanished, the first piece is either 0 or L over 2. Let me write this down as, uh, as, as, as L over 2, delta n, n prime. Where the delta n, n prime is just either 0 if n not equal to n prime, and it's 1 when n is equal to n prime. I'm just condensing my uh, split of the two possible cases. Okay. And this delta is called the chronicle delta function. Okay. Either 0 or 1, depending on what the two arguments which go in. n equals n prime, it's 1. and not equals n prime, it's 0. Okay. All okay with that? There's also a Dirac delta function, which will be in, uh, in quantum mechanics next term, which is much more fun and much more nasty. It's really nasty to be on the delta function. It's not even a function. <laughs> it's a generalized distribution. It's, it's some weird stuff going on with that. Never got this stuff together. Anyways, so what's on the left-hand side? I have sum n. By some I mean SUM, not SOM. <laughs> dn, L over 2, delta n, n prime, equals the right hand side. Let's put this back now. dx, px, sine n prime by x over L. Okay. Now, here is the, the beauty of the, of the chronic delta function. I'm summing from n equals 1 to infinity. The, L over 2 is a constant, you pull this out. So I have L over 2, sum over n equals 1 to infinity, dn delta n n prime equals integral dx, same old stuff, let's put this down quickly, n prime x over L, n prime, 0 to L. Alright, now let's stare at this for an instant. The sum, let's stare at this. <coughs> what is that? What value does it have? It's not a numerical value, but let's see. Think n prime to be a certain number now. I chose some n prime, right? Think it to be, let's say, 7, right? So say n prime were 7. Okay. Let's start summing stuff over. When n is 1, what's the value of the sum? Of the sum? 0. Why? Because it doesn't match n prime. When n is 2, what's the value? 0. n is 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, bam! It peaks only at n equals 7. This sum is only non-zero for the n equals 7 value. Because for all other n's, the delta function is 0. Okay? And I just chose 7 to be a random thing. It could be a million and we could you know, do this game. But so from here, it's only picking up the term when n equals n prime. So what gets picked out is d n prime. So this is n over 2, d n prime, d n prime equals integral dx, dx, sine, n prime, x by over L. The delta function in the sum helped me pick out a certain d n prime. I can multiply the L over 2 there, dn, and n prime was just some, it was some random integer, it was a placeholder, okay? So I can just use it, I can rename it to call it n now. I found all of them, for any n prime. Let me just wipe for the prime, prime just hurts everyone. Let's call it dn, which is just L over 2 over L, integral 0 to L, dx, dx, sine n by x over l. 
we found the Px. Px is known, L is known, OP2 is known, signs are known, integrate, get the value. So from the Fourier series, which looks so horrible, I was able to extract out each of those Bn's, which multiply each of the sign terms, by doing the Fourier's inversion trick. Okay? Now what was the flow again? The flow was, look at the function at t equals to zero, look at the shape at t equals to zero. This is what you have, unknown Bn's. Multiply on both sides by sine some other integer, n prime, pi x over L, known function, this side, Integrate with x. On the right hand side, signs are orthonormal functions, therefore they reduce down to L over 2 delta n, delta n n prime. You work it out, you get the signs. Do we all see that? Question? Yes. So is that true for any case when we know the initial shape and it starts from rest? We can just initial shape, fixed, fixed, you're good to go. Huh? Yes. Well, if we were working this out, we just go from like product of the sign. Yes, you can. But in all your problems, you write this down, and then from here, say you're using the Fourier inversion trick, from here, you go directly here. You don't have to prove this every time. But it's important to know what happens, because someday in life, when you'll use this, and trust me, you will, <coughs> this function might look a little different. It might be a cosine. Things might be slightly off. So just knowing what is to be done, gives you a strong foothold on stuff, okay? The, we're not trying to teach you, we're not trying to make you robust, just like, you know, solve stuff. We're going to give you a feel of how things work, okay? So you found the BNs. All with me. Okay? All right, that's good. So, probably go here. I mean, there are people everywhere, so you should be fair. And this say n prime thing was just to kind of give you an idea. It is true for any n prime. All right, so where were we? We had our initial string. This pluck string, pluck in the middle, okay? I know P of X. I know how to find the BNs. You can just find it now, okay? So for my, for my pluck string, so for the string which looks like that, at t equals to zero, I can find BNs. What are BNs? BN. Px is a known function. It's a piecewise function. So I can split this integration into 0 to L over 2 and L over 2 to L. Okay? Put, by, put back P of x to be this linear function for half the first half range. Second thing for the, for the second half range. And do the integration. <coughs> and you can use mathematica here. Okay? You don't mind. Just, just plug Mathematica, I will give you an answer, okay? And I did this last night, and what I found was something nice. Okay, so I solved for this. So my Bn's come out to be 8h over pi squared n squared times sine n pi over 2. Mathematica can give you this. Just plug the Px, do this, <coughs> Mathematica. Or oh, from Alpha, anything, you can talk to this. They're smart. That's the end. What's sine n pi over 2? It's a multiple of pi over 2. So depending on if n is, uh, n is an odd or an even integer, it will be either 1 or minus 1. Right? So uh, this is... 8h over pi squared n squared times um, 0 if n is uh, some 2n. If it's, if it's even, it's, a, it's an integer times pi. And if it's odd, if n is 2n plus 1, then it's minus 1 to the n. Is that okay? Let's verify. When n is 0, it's 0. When n is 1, it's minus 1 to the 0, which is 1. n is 2, it's 0 again, because sine is sine pi. Um, when n is 3, it's sine 3 pi over 2, which is minus 1. So, okay? So we found the Bn's. So therefore, y, x comma 0, my initial shape, 
which was Px, this same shape that we had, this h thing, zero to l, this shape I decomposed as a sum of n's, corresponding into sum of m's, because m tells me it's a zero or one. Okay. So I'm summing from m now equals zero to infinity. It was n, I just changed it to m by relabeling my variables. I have 8h over 5 squared, n is um, 2m plus 1, that's only when it contributes, and the sine is minus 1 to the m, times sine 2m plus 1 by x. I did nothing, I just, I just used the initial Fourier expansion, I plugged in the BNs. The BNs were, in this case, the BNs were only non zero when n was an odd integer, and therefore I summed it up. And for the other ones, it vanished, and we got the odd that survived, and this is what I have. Did you all see that? Yes. Where did the n come from again? Um, can you see it from that, or is it hard? Uh, sure. Sure, okay, <laughs> I, can, I can bring the board. <laughs> um, I could kind of see, I just didn't see where the m came from. So sine n pi over 2 yeah. is either 0 or 1 or minus 1, yeah. depending on what n is. Okay. I just split the cases, that if n is an even integer, then any even divided by 2 is another integer. So sine integer pi oh, is 0. Oh, m is just an integer. Okay. M is just I an thought integer. it was like something on the side. No, no, m is an integer. So m goes from 1, uh, 0, 1, 2, okay. And then I just plug this back in. It should have been the sum over n. But then I moved the variable to an m. <coughs> for all odd ends, it vanished to zero. For all the even ends, this is what I have. Okay. And finally, what's my general solution at any time t? Y x comma t. The glorious finale of the whole thing. It's sum over m zero to infinity. Use the same numbers d's. So in this case. It's H, H minus 1 to the M over pi squared 2M plus 1 squared times sine 2M <coughs> plus 1 by X over L. How do you go to the, to the, um, to the full um, oscillation? You have it, we found, we removed the cosine because T was 0. Just We'll put the cosine back. Okay? That's the, the time dependent oscillation. So that is cosine omega m. And that is it. This is what gives you the oscillation of the wave for arbitrary times. This is everything is known here. It might not look too pretty, but it's nice. And let's look at a few more cool things about this. Let's plot Bn's. Not Bn, Bn's. As a function of n, Bn. So n can be 1, n can be 2, 3, 4, 5, <coughs> 6, 7. When n is 1, okay, that's, that should be, I think that down without hurting my hand. Okay, look at the Bn. When n is 1, it's uh, sine n pi over 2 is 1, it's 8h over pi squared 1 squared. So it's some positive number. When n is 2, what is the value? 0. When n is 3, what's the value? It's some value, is it positive or negative? Negative. It's n squared, the denominator gets smaller, so it's somewhere here. Maybe it's better chalk to make this more apparent. When n is 4, what's the value? Zero. n is 5, positive, smaller. n is 6, n is 7, n is 8. The contribution of the higher harmonics, the higher frequencies, is going down due to the Fourier decomposition. The first few harmonics contribute the most. One feature. Second feature. Does it make sense that all the odd harmonics vanished? Let's look at my function. The middle plucking. 
On the even harmonics, N2, N4, N6, how do they look like? So N equals 1 looks like half a sine wave. N equals 2 looks like one full sine wave. N equals 3 looks like three half sine waves. N equals 4 looks like looks like two sine waves. Okay? N is 1, N is 2, N is 3, N is 4. Now notice N2, N4, N6 at the center, they never oscillate. There's a node at the center for all the even ends. But I started off with a, with a displacement at the center. So therefore, they could never even contribute. Right off the bat, you could have said, by my symmetry argument, by looking at the features of the Fourier decomposition, the evens would never have contributed because the evens always have a node in the center. But my plucked initial condition doesn't have a node at the center. Okay? So what we are doing here is we just decompose my function into a bunch of sine terms. Some of these functions with numbers and the numbers of the Bs, the Bns. Okay? Well, that was nice. You can't deny that. Might have been a little hard to go through it. It was nice. Does this make sense? Everyone was as helpful to see this in full detail once at least. Okay. Um, all right. <laughs> what did I find? I found this decomposition in terms of Bn and sines, and I have a sum of 2m plus 1 squares. Evaluate that by x comma 0 at x equals L over 2 and times 0. Evaluate that function at the middle of the string. What's the value at the middle of the string? It's h. What does the decomposition say? Can someone prompt me? I, I can't see. Sum m 0 to infinity h minus 1 to the m over 2m plus 1 squared pi squared times sine 2m plus 1 pi l over 2 over l. So it's just this. I love seeing faces checking back and forth. <laughs> you all see this? And x equal l over 2. Yes. Say that again. There's an 8. Thank you. Uh, 8. Looks good? Thanks. So everyone sees this? Okay. Minus 1 to the m times sine 2 m plus 1 pi over 2. This whole thing is always 1. <laughs> Convince yourselves. Whenever this is minus 1, this is minus 1. <coughs> it's always cancel out. Okay. So what do I have? The h's cancel, this numbers. I can pull it out. I have some m 0 to infinity 1 over 2m plus 1 whole square equals a square. <laughs> That's a good feeling. We solved the Basel problem using strings and Fourier decomposition. We all see it. Questions? Please smile. We saw like a 400 year old problem. And we didn't. We saw it like 300 years later, but we still did. <laughs> so if you were Leonard Euler back in the day, you did something and you solved it. And we use a guitar string butter in the middle and stuff like that. Yes? Where did like the y of x over equal over 2 minus comma 0 go? Like, does it equal that? Yeah, it does. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Anything else? I had more examples to do, like more smaller ones, which are not that hard. But if, you, if you've done this once, everything is in your bank. Okay. So let me show you a couple of cool things, which will kind of give you a, uh, an understanding of um, how these features behave. <coughs> Could that be pulled out of there, or you can't? Say that again? You couldn't pull that out from there, like knowing the sun. From here? Yeah. And that's what I did, right? Yeah, but I'm saying like in our, in our general solution. Uh-huh. Could you use... No, 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 no. So it would have been just been super hard. Oh, okay. Because this has my independence as well. Oh. The point is that I have a generic dependence. I just tuned it in such a way that I could get what I wanted to get. So this thing wasn't oh. obvious. It had to be realized, but this is part of the string, everything worked out. And then we like saw, oh, 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 something cool is going on here. And we could like pull out what we wanted by looking at certain features at certain times, and it gave us some mathematical correspondences. Okay. This should work. So we promise. Any other questions? Um, so that result is for like that specific shape of string, right? Uh, so or this result is a mathematical result in number theory. Okay. We were able to derive this very famous result by looking at the Fourier decomposition of a string. Of a string or of, of this, this string? Of this string. We looked at the string, okay. we used this mechanism to solve for this. Cool. If there was some other thing, like let's say at one third you plucked it, you could not have got this relation. Okay, so we get something else, so maybe. Happened. Just so happened that I you know, wanted to show you this thing and I did that. Okay. <laughs> a little bit mathematical work. I thought, how about if you want to look for oscillation of a certain drum like shape? I mean, in class, you can solve for it with the circular drum or the square drum, maybe in one homework. That's boring stuff. Let's look for Pikachu. So imagine Pikachu for a two dimensional drum. And let's look at the normal frequencies of this Pikachu drum. I'm sorry, uh, Pikachu, but uh, this is the first normal mode, which has <laughs> <laughs> It's like a single sine wave. The second normal mode has <laughs> okay. You go on to higher frequency, higher normal modes. You get more and more complicated normal modes of Pikachu. <laughs> okay. I know I'm a, I'm a horrible person. Animal rights people fight to Okay. You, you see what's happening? So what we did was we just used the, um, if you want like a more fancy word for what we did, we used the Laplacian operator. We found its eigen spectrum. We found its eigen values subject to Dirichlet boundary conditions, which were fixed on the ends. So I fixed Pikachu on the ends. That doesn't sound very nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then I looked for the Laplacian eigenspectrum, which is what we were doing in one dimension today. I like the sound system going on. <laughs> Finally, I want to bring your attention to a classic work, which was asked in 1966 by a mathematician named Mark Katz. Okay, it's, it's written as Kat, K I think it's pronounced as Katz. So the question this guy asked was, can you hear the shape of the drum? Could you just listen to the normal mode frequencies, omega <coughs> 1 to infinity? If I give you these numbers, without looking at the drum, could you tell what the drum looks like, what the shape of the drum is? Okay. And you might again wonder, he says nicely, why should we care? You should care because this has applications, as this paper mentions, I and mean, we've seen it in like quantum theory, in um, theory of heat transfer, you name it, like how fireflies behave, all this Fourier stuff is important. Okay. So you ask the question, can you hear the normal mode frequencies, just by knowing what the frequencies are, and then reconstruct the shape of the drum? And the answer is unfortunately a no. Kind of disappointing that you cannot do that. And uh, some person in 1992, these three people, Gordon, Webb, and Wolpert, they gave these two drums in figure one. 
which looked different, but had the exact same spectrum, the exact same eigenvalue, the exact same normal mode frequencies, okay? But those are not nice terms. I don't want to play that, okay? So they meant some two-dimensional membrane, which can do it. Turns out that those two drums, which look different but have the same shape, are special in the sense that you could cut and stick things around to kind of you know rearrange it into one thing to the other. So they had some kind of a symmetry in them. But it's not all sad and gloomy. There is a notion in which the answer to the question is yes, that you can reconsider the shape of the drum. For special drums, which have a smooth boundary. The boundary is not jagged like Pikachu. You know? <laughs> I'm gonna get that shock someday. Point being that if the boundary is smooth and there is one line of mirror symmetry, if across one line the drum looks symmetrical, then yes. You can hear the spectrum, you can hear the ideal frequencies, you can hear the normal mode frequencies and reconstruct its shape. And by smooth, I mean, if you're mathematically inclined, it means, it means it's analytic, it's a bunch of properties. But for us, we can think of it as a smooth, um, uh, like, a non, like a differentiable boundary everywhere, and one line of middle symmetry. And how do you solve this? It goes back into ideas, oops, <coughs> ideas of number theory, which are called Riemann zeta functions. What they're doing is they're summing over integers to a certain power in the inverse, which is what we did today as well in the Boston problem. The point being that if you want to reconstruct the shape of the drum by looking at all the frequencies, you want to combine all the frequencies in a sum in such a way which says something about its analytical properties. And it's, it's mind-boggling to me that results in number theory, how primes Prime numbers work, like how they are separated, like how they kind of, what, what features they have. That features into finding out whether you can hear the shape of a drum. Can you reconstruct the Fourier decomposition by hearing each of the modes? And part of this we saw today in class as one special case of the Riemann zeta function uh, in a certain sense uh, as the Boson problem. Okay, so I hope this kind of gives you a bigger picture sense. I'll try and do more examples on Wednesday. I'll think about where we are in the course and how we can like adjust everything. But hopefully this gave you a sense of how to approach these problems. Because we got the sense it's gonna be so have a good weekend and I'll see you next time.